Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the first edition of Performing Resistance Dialogues on Arts, Migrations, Inclusive Cities. This is an international summer school, which is part of the international project Atlas of Transitions Biennale, and it is promoted by Emilia Romagna Teatro Fondazione, the Department of Sociology and Business Law of the University of Bologna, and Cantieri Metici. This is a series of online talks, lectures and dialogues featuring scholars, curators and international artists. You can follow us on Facebook and YouTube and the streams will be available for a few days on our social network. The festival opened last Monday and all the talks are available on the Performing Resistance platform. Today is the last day of this edition, which will be concluded with two meetings, this one and the next this afternoon at 3 p.m. about the subject of performing diversity. Each talk lasts one hour. The first 40 minutes will be a discussion with our guests and then we will be open to your comments and questions. So please do participate, write your questions and comments, and we will try to collect them and respond to as many as possible. I'm delighted to introduce, to introduce you to our guest, Nikos Papasterkiadis, Director of the Research Unit in Public Culture and Professor in the School of Culture and Communication at the University of Melbourne, co-founder of the Spatial Aesthetics Research Cluster and project leader of the Australian Research Council Lead Change Project, Large Screens and the Transnational Public Sphere. Professor Papasterkiadis has also worked in collaborative projects with artists and theorists of international reputation, such as John Berger, Jimmy Daran, and Sonia Boyce. He has produced an immense amount of exquisite work. The list of publication is very considerable and very impressive. It includes the books, uh, I will mention just the last title, The Turbulence of Migration, 2000, Metaphor and Tension, 2004, Spatial Aesthetics, Art Place and the Everyday, 2006, Cosmopolitanism and Culture, 2012, that is now being translated and will come out later this year by Franco Angeli. So, I would like to start with some theoretical reflections on your concept of ambient fear. You devise this concept reflecting on the post 9 11 effect, and it found full expression in your seminal work, Cosmopolitanism Culture. The ambient fear, as you said, is not an object oriented fear, it's uh, something much more dispersed. And in your book, you reflected on a society dominated by the fear that the enemy could be anyone or anywhere. Um, in the age of pandemic, uh, this concept, uh, ambient fear, but also the one which is related in the intimate enemy, reveal themselves as extremely relevant um, because now they are intertwined with this new reality, with the current crisis, and with new meanings. So, would you please explain and expand them here with a new insight given by the current crisis? First of all, Emanuela, let me say thank you very much for the introduction. And I would like to express my deep thanks also to the hosts, to Pierluigi in particular, and my profound solidarity with the projects that you're all involved in. And so I commend you for the great work you're already doing. It's indeed a great honor for me from Melbourne, Australia, to, to be part of these conversations in Italy and, and the rest of the world. As you say, um, these new crises, this uh, pandemic that we're in, makes us reflect on many words which are both past and present, familiar and unfamiliar. Um, you use the terms ambient fear and intimate enemy, which is, I've used in previous publications. But in Australia, let me say now that <clears throat> we have a habit of um, domesticating complex things by giving them abbreviations. Making the unknown seem more cute by giving it a smaller name. Right now, um, two words have appeared in our lexicon. ISO and Quoro. Quoro coming from your word quarantine, and ISO from isolation. So we have a habit of wanting to make things small in order to make them manageable. 
But these words sometimes do not perform the function that they're actually meant to do. And in fears is a way of reminding us that even words fail to realize their own objectives. Now, the word ambient, ambient fears has a very positive original memory and association. It comes from Brian, for me, it of course has a lot of other his references, but for me, the seminal reference was from Brian Eno, the musician. Mm. And one day while he was recovering from a car accident, he was sitting in his room listening to some music while it was raining outside. He was probably a little bit drugged from all the medication that he was taking. And he was sitting there listening and he couldn't quite identify the source of different sounds. He was in a situation where, for various reasons, the room, the, the body, the sound all fused together. Now, he wanted to use this experience in a productive way and see how art could also absorb and respond to this saturation, this tinting of atmospheres with different cultural tones and effects. But it seems to me now that benign and positive and aesthetic use has been hijacked and adopted for political, social, and other economic uses. We can understand how there is an ambience in so many different environments now, which is both benign and dangerous, both opportunistic and destructive. And so through the concept of ambient fear, I wanted to sort of draw our attention to way, the ways in which our environments, our urban landscape, our workplaces, even our home environments, are saturated by so many media, we're getting so many inputs and so many sources of information that it's often impossible to know exactly where anything comes from. So we're constantly sticking together little fragments, little ideas from diverse sources to create other micro-narratives with which we try to constitute a sense of meaning in our lives. Now, that sounds quite open-ended and diffuse and, and, um, and, and possibly positive or negative, but the intimate enemy concept helps us politicize these concepts a little bit more. And I'm glad you've brought them together in this way. That helps us think so it's just not an aesthetic, but also it has a political function. Because the concept of political, of intimate enemy, is derived from an Indian philosopher and cultural theorist called Ashish Nandi. In fact, he wrote a book called The Intimate Enemy. And in that book, um, he was trying to portray a certain character that appeared on the Indian landscape through the colonial adventures. And this is a character who consciously, unconsciously, willingly, unwillingly adopted, embodied, internalized the colonial order. Having absorbed it into their body, having transformed their own habits, customs, and mindset, in a sense, they became Indians who were performing something outside of their culture that had been imposed on their culture. But also, what they had done was had their own imagination taken over by the apparatus of colonialism. Their mindset was colonized. The imagination was colonized. Their habits were reset. Their sense of possibility and their understanding of progress was also realigned according to the priorities of colonialism. Now, in the pandemic, it's very important to realize how our mindsets and our habits and our imagination can also be colonized by the fear of this virus. This virus, which we don't know where it is, we can't see it, we, we don't know who's got it and how, and how it'll spread, but we know it's there somewhere and no one is completely immune to it yet, assuming a vaccine will ever be found. And so on, we will, but so we know that it's there and it's a risk. The question is, to what extent will it transform our bodies? Now, you mentioned how ambient fears was used in 9-11. Now, we also must remember that once our habits are changed because of fear, it's very hard to unchange those habits. Now, very few people will remember Richard Reed. Richard Reed was a, a British black British subject 
who had the crazy idea of installing a bomb in his boot, in his in his trainers, and tried to get on an aeroplane, and became famously known as known as the shoe bomber. He was unsuccessful, but he was successful in other ways, in, in the sense that he's changed the habits of all of us every time we get on an aeroplane. We all have to take off our shoes every time we go in and out of Heathrow or Washington or New York or wherever. And that habit has persisted for 20 years. I don't think anyone's ever tried to put a bomb in their shoe ever since. But it's very interesting to see how these instances can transform our, our behaviours and completely alter the way in which we use our bodies. Thank you very much. That was very interesting and it's interesting to see the connection between what happened at the beginning of the decades and uh, with what everything is happening now. And uh, it is very true because I think that never, um, as never before, there was a, like a common perception of an intimate enemy uh, among us. I remember that in the full lockdown mode, we really did internalize this feeling of an invisible enemy. And you could see, you could see this uh, uh, also from the anxiety uh, that was spread during uh, in, the, in the supermarkets, for example, or in the narrow sidewalks. Or sometimes you could also listen from empty windows uh, uh, calls addressed to passersby to return and stay home. Or also, there was also some cases of aggression to bikers. So, all symptoms of a general um, disease and uh, fear, fear in a very dispersed way. So I do think this concept really can, can help us to elaborate the present in order to reimagine and reinvent the future. I, I like your emphasis on the, on the imagination. So um, on this point and drawing on this, drawing on this concept, what sort of future do you envision? Uh, do you imagine a world where isolationism and uh, authoritarianism <clears throat> will be increased uh, um, together with the building of new walls, ghetto and the consolidation of a uh, fortress Europe? Because we are really witnessing an uh, exacerbation of the existing social divisions of race, class and gender. Um, Otherwise, uh, on a more positive note, uh, uh, would you rather suggest that this is an opportunity to reinvent, reimagine radically our actions, places and flows in such a way uh, they could uh, foster a more open and uh, relational sense of belonging and uh, more broadly a different relationship with the planet? Yes. Yes, very, very profound question and, and vast, So, but I'll try to be brief. I, I agree with you. Um, at the beginning and still, because in my city of Melbourne, um, we were about to go into stage three of uh, a relaxation of the uh, uh, restrictions of movement and, in, and participation. In, but today, the Premier of our state, not the Prime Minister, because it's all done regionally, He's announced that we have to go back one step because in this last week, a few more cases of community infection have, have been identified. And although the mortality rate is very low in Australia, um, they are very vigilant because this is a country that was built on quarantine, remember. So we have, we, you know, when we were established as a colony, there were more quarantine stations than there were churches. So. It's not. It's something that is deep in the psyche of this country. But um, and and like you say, within our own bodies, we become very um, uh, vigilant and paranoid. And and I remember very early in this beginning of this panic, pandemic panic, I sneezed into my arm in a health food store. And of course, you know, people in health food stores are very conscious of their health. So honestly, I felt like I made the, the shop. E evaporate or something people were running into all the corners <laughs> it was very embarrassing and i felt like i couldn't have done a worse thing in my life at that point but the reality is um these 
moments can bring out extreme reactions, not just in, in on, the, on the pavements and in shops, as you say, but also on a governmental level. The government in Australia reacted in a very militaristic and racialized way in, at the outset of this pandemic. The moment it was discovered that the, the, pan, that the pandemic, uh, well, at that point it was just an epidemic, was identified in China, in Wuhan, um, the Australian government evacuated all the Australian residents and citizens, de- took them to an island which had been previously used for the detention of refugees called Christmas Island, kept them there in quarantine for two weeks, tested them, and then allowed them onto Australia territory, onto the mainland territory, because the Australian island of, of um Christmas Island had been excised from our territorial constitutional rights. That's another complicated story about refugees and international law and morality. But nevertheless, so the first response was a very militarized and racialized um, campaign. It was tightly organized and very well, in that sense, well delivered because it, 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 it led to no further infections. Somehow, the rest of Australia thought, well, we're lucky, we're a long way away from this, we can just happily live oblivious and indifferent to this problem that's occurring only in Asia. Eventually, they realised that this had spread to Europe, to Italy, to England, to North America, and that people coming home from those places or on cruise boats were also liable to be carriers. When there was a big cruise ship in Sydney where they knew that many people were infected, the government went into complete disorganisation. One department from the federal handballed it to the state, the state passed it back to the city, and so on and so forth, and no one was in control. And eventually, the captain just told everybody, white middle-class Australians, to get off the ship. They got off, jumped into taxis, and that was the primary cause of the spread of the disease in Australia. It was white people on boats, not black people or colored people on boats, but white middle class people. So somehow we forgave those people and we didn't blame them, we didn't stigmatize them, we didn't turn into this into a racialist campaign, But Chinese students felt very insecure walking around the streets of Melbourne. Some were harassed and and were abused. And so we saw this very um, ugly side and very hypocritical side of our character. And, And it's true, the crisis accentuated the structural inequalities of our society. Both the racialist and classed categories were brought to the surface. And in that sense, it's made us um, reflect on the persistence of those um, structures of inequality in our in our country. But it's also made us reflect on, as you say, the possibilities for, for connection. And as we all went into isolation or into quarantine or into Um, home education or working online and doing everything by Zoom as we are now, um, there was at the same time a deeper desire for intimacy and connection, even though social media often produces greater distance. It overcomes distance, but it takes away proximities. It, It overcomes distance in the sense that you can have connections with people from different places and far away locations, but the more direct and face-to-face, skin-to-skin kinds of connections often dissipate contacts through the screen. Now, that is one of the great paradoxes. So while people were, were at home or in isolation, they were increasingly connected by these new technologies. And People of my daughter's generation who are already fluent, in fact, you could say social media is their first language. Social distancing was not such a shock to their system at first. I think with time, it has become quite confrontational and and created its own sorts of psychological and social problems. 
But it's also made us reflect on what it's like to live in a city where there's less traffic, where there's less pollution. What is it like to not have to travel at vast distances to do very small things? What's it like when the earth gets a chance to breathe? What is, it possible, what is the possibilities for us to have those sense of connections with more fundamental things, more basic things like cooking and caring for your body? And the, these are the positives that have come from this crisis. And I'm glad that you um, synthesized and put in some dialectical tension these two dim dimensions of the crisis. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, um, also, uh, it, it is true that um, the current crisis uh, it is also exacerbated by um, the situation uh, um, uh, which concerns the detention camps because it's still there and uh, it's not uh, easier uh, for them to experience uh, all that um, now. So, um, in the light of all uh, these aspects, one of the challenges we face uh, is to reinvent uh, our, our ways, our modes of sociality. Um, these issues concern the aspect of uh, social interaction in daily life, but also in the artistic field. Now that the lockdown is easing in many countries, people are going out and meeting family, meeting close friends, yet people outside this closed circle are perceived more than before as a possible threat. And as far as concerned the art, I'm also thinking of the future of multicultural festivals and other art artistic events because they offer opportunities for cross-border contact between people, to uh, the opportunity to experience uh, openness, uh, to come in contact with the other. And these opportunities now currently are denied. So my question is, uh, how public space uh, is being transformed after the trauma of the pandemic? Uh, and uh, how art and culture might change uh, and how do you think art can help to overcome this regression in terms of humanity and hospitality? I think the first thing that art can do is to puncture our narcissism, is to expose our own um, uh, weaknesses and fantasies and put them in a different context, to displace them, to disconnect them from our own immediate reference points. I had many friends who, on return from overseas during this period, were put into two weeks of, of isolation inside hotels. So for two weeks, they weren't allowed to leave a room. Food was brought to them. And in other words, they lived in a much better version, but in a similar, in a sort of proximate condition to the refugees. They were detained. But they had a 14-day time frame around it. And even still, with this very clear boundary of 14 days, many of them complained very deeply and profoundly, but self-consciously as well, that this 14 days almost drove them over the edge. Imagine if you'd been in that condition for seven years and that you were traumatized on a daily basis, brutalized, dehumanized, abused, you know, ridiculed, and, and separated from family and so on in, 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 every, in every other way and had already come out of a war zone rather than back from a holiday. So it was a, a great opportunity, in a sense, for us to sort of put things in perspective. Not that we needed it, but, but we, in fact, it, again, it accentuated the, um, the, uh, the ways in which in any social system there are pockets of abuse. And the pocket of abuse, we got a little window into that through this instance. So that was that's one of the things that art can do and has been doing, is to sort of puncture our narcissism and to provide a window into this other kind of situation. Now, what art has also been doing is for, for, a, for a number of decades now is been intervening into public spaces. We know that, and art has wanted to leave the walls of the gallery, leave the institutional parameters of the 
museum, to go to where the action is, to be with the people, to, in, to meld and, and reorganize itself in the activity of everyday life. Now, at the same time, cities have been transformed as well. Cities, of course, in the ancient world were cities where, where had walls around them. And, the inner, and, and what was inside the center of those walls was where safety, security, and, and the cultural icons were. The industrial age saw the cities spread and also diseases concentrate in different parts like ports and so on. Now the contemporary city has reconfigured the inside, the outside, the, the, the suburb and the center and has created diversity and cosmopolitanism and multiculturalism and all these kinds of buzzwords as op marketing opportunities to enhance tourism, to, in, to make environments more fa favorable for investment, to make expatriates feel more excited and willing to be there and so on and so forth. So we've seen how the artists have been entangled and been co-opted and often hijacked in these um, new public policies and investment strategies. But at the same time, artists have tried to re redefine and re reconfigure these possibilities and, pro and provide critiques in those sorts of spaces. So for a long time, both artists and then artists who have come from a minority background in particular, or have been migrants themselves, have been thinking very much about the idea of what the Thai artist Rikrit Chiriavanija calls sculpting hospitality. How do you create scenarios in which people can socialize together and collaborate and share things and exchange things that they would otherwise not do? So the main thrust of that trajectory of socially engaged art, participatory art, relational aesthetics, call it what you like. The thrust of that has been how to intervene in public space, how to make strangers touch each other, how foreign people who are foreign from each other can find things in common with each other. Now, that has been a, 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 a whole scenario that presupposed the physicality and the co-presence of strangers in, 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 in urban environments. That phenomenon, that trajectory in art is going to find a radical wall. The, the ghettos and fortifications and the invisible barriers that were there beforehand are now ha have now reappeared. In an Anglo-Saxon country like Australia, for people to socialize together, they had to get drunk. You know, the idea of just being civil was impossible without alcohol. The idea now that foreigners, minority groups, other cult people from other cultures who do not use alcohol in the same way have tried to introduce into our society, it's been profound. It's been absolutely wonderful to see the transformation of the ways in which public space can be used without often degenerating into a war zone or into a drunken orgy or battle or whatever it is that is often the case when um, these scenarios happen. But without disappearing into these um, very specific examples, I want to sort of think, rethink the way in which sociality is going to be reimagined after this pandemic. And I think it's going to require a different way of thinking about the aesthetics of care how we care for each other in, a in an increasingly mediated world. You know, hospitality is about care for the other. It's also about welcoming the other without calculation, without consideration of who they are and what benefit it brings me. It's a duty that comes before that calculation is made. And so if the care for the other is going to be mediated by screens, as it increasingly is, if our co-presence is going to be mediated by new technologies, then we have to be very careful how we humanize those technologies rather than enabling those technologies to redetermine the parameters and directions of our own humanity. Because I'm sure many people will be familiar that every institution wants to get the most out of a crisis. I work for an institution, it's called a university, or uni as we call it here in Australia, and they are run like a corporation, and this is a great opportunity to extract more from labor. 
This is a great opportunity to instill greater fear, insecurity, and precarity in the conditions of labor. So in this crisis, there is no doubt that there are many people who are going to try and use the new technology to enhance control and surveillance and to accentuate the power hierarchy that is there. It's up to us to find patterns of resistance so that we can find our places of comfort and security and not confine ourselves to the smaller and smaller sphericals that you mentioned, but find other safe ways to bust out of our little spheres and provide connections with others. Thank you. Uh, yes, I totally agree. We, we, we do need uh, absolutely to rethink uh, to our public space uh, um, in order also to, um, to continue to congregate uh, the sphere of, uh, also of activism with uh, all the health measures which is not so uh, so easy. And uh, um, as far as concerned, the uh, transformation of spaces and also the usage of space, it is true that in these days we are seeing uh, images of restaurant beaches and uh, uh, all with transparent barriers which separate people. And uh, I have also seen images uh, from uh, rave parties where the participants dance enclosed in the limited spaces. So we can see a complete subversion of the event because the rave is mainly an illegal event which occurs in the city margins where people get very close to each other and now it's an event that has integrated, integrated the social distancing. And um, what have you said is very interesting because uh, it concerns also the political sphere. For instance, I'm imagining to uh, for example, the supporters of Trump, they have denied the, um, the need of, to use uh, uh, pro protection equipment. No, they have uh, shown quite a disdain toward, uh, toward the, uh, the threat of COVID-19. And I'm thinking then uh, to the contradiction which lies in the manifestation, where it's challenging to keep uh, uh, to respect social distancing and uh, to combine uh, the uh, political action in, um, in a situation which requires some kind of promiscuity. And, um, and moreover, uh, um, as far as concerned the territory, we are facing witness new issues that concern the body and territory control because uh, um, a space that needs to be controlled, uh, it is, uh, of course, a militarized space. You know? So all this, all this question have been uh, um, faced and we have to, um, to think new ways. So this is in the, um, in the civic life, in the daily life, but also in, uh, in, the, in the artistic field. And, uh, I wanted to ask you uh, about uh, the use of personal pr protective equipment uh, such as face masks and gloves. Um, how much will, will they have an impact on society and more specifically on art, activism and hospitality? Uh, by instance, uh, also um, I'm referring also to what we're saying about intimacy, aesthetic of care, uh, being each other near, no? um, express solidarity. Um, the people involved in conversations, they are like put in a state of uncertainty about the others' feeling, about the others' feedback, about the others' emotions. Um, strangely enough, it is more in intimate now to interact via screen than in the flesh, than in the flesh, uh, when the face is covered, because um, you can't really in the screen you can see the expression of the face. I can see uh, properly your eyes uh, and make a contact with what you're saying. I can be aware if you are disapproving me or if you are if you are with me. 
And the other question I want to ask about these tools, uh, about masks, gloves, and so on, is the symbolic level. What do you think the associated meaning of masks and gloves are? What and what are they evocative of? Hmm. Very interesting question once again, and very deep and rich associations for me, all of those questions. Um, about 10 years ago, I embarked on a project which you mentioned in the introduction about large screens. And, and I was flying to Seoul, and as I was flying, we did this sort of circuit of the city, and it was quite late at night, and I observed from, from the aeroplane how the city was incredibly powerfully lit. All the tall buildings had large screens that were beautifully lit up, and it was quite a uh, powerful image. And when I landed and, uh, and met my colleagues, um, I was really, uh, who worked for an art gallery called Nabi, um, they, they explained to me how the large screens operate in Seoul. They're on top of large buildings, and usually they're used for advertising, short, sharp messages, or short, sharp um, news bulletins. And I said, what, are they ever used for artistic purposes? I said, very rarely, you know, some festivals here. And I, and I, and I thought to myself that in Melbourne, we had just opened a large square with a large screen on it. And I thought, what would be the possibility of connecting two large screens together so that simultaneously you saw the same message or the same experience, the same artwork, and then through your mobile phone had an opportunity to interact with the content of that screen and thereby transforming the content, not only in the screen that you were watching in Melbourne, but also the content of the screen in Seoul. I proposed that idea to my colleagues because they, their, their gallery also had a large screen on the outside of their building. And so after a lot of bit of, quite a bit of experimentation, we did a number of projects where the public were invited to participate in different kinds of artistic events where they could interact with the, with the artistic content that was on the screen in front of their public environment in Melbourne or Seoul. And we also did some feedback in investigations and in exploration of the people's experience, some sort of sociological studies. I'll never forget um, the, the responses that we got from the Koreans. First of all, there was enormous anxiety that the Koreans would be reluctant to do anything in a public environment. But then what we discovered is that the young people said, oh, this is like karaoke in, public, in a public square. This is us enabling to perform as we do on a, in front of a screen in an interior, in an exterior. So it was a little step. It, was a, it wasn't a huge step. It was a little step for them. But what, so the reluctance disappeared. There was active in, engagement and enthusiastic participation. However, what I found very interesting was that the technology was quite crude on the Australian in comparison to the Korean end. And the Koreans all complained that the quality of the image from Australia wasn't satisfactory to their standards. And when we asked even more about that, it says we couldn't see into people's eyes clearly enough. So this desire, as you say, for feeling connection by looking into someone's face and seeing their eyes is very profound and a deeply human um, urge and wish. And it's something that has sort of stayed with me for a long time. And we worked very hard on improving, of course, the resolution and pixelation of the screens so that that could be resolved. But it does go back to the core point about politics and the face, the body and, and the city, the polis and, and, and politics. Because the body is so important. It was making yourself visible. Occupying a certain space was part of the processes by which political change happens. Not just in ancient Greek polis of Athens, but throughout the, the whole modern period. It was as the mob took to the cities, took to the streets, that changes were activated. Now, as you say, this process of making yourself visible in public space, demanding, occupying, has been completely cut across with new anxieties and new fears. But there's also a powerful backlash in terms of how we can possibly be in that kind of space, not only keeping our distance, but also wearing some protective masks. Now, I find it, as you say, 
very, very interesting that the Trump supporters express disdain towards the mask. I'm not sure, but I'm speculating, and I'm speculating that their disdain has two sources. One, it reminds them of the veil, as if that is an Islamic Eastern presence. Not, for, not remembering that the veil was also part of Christianity and deeply part of the Western um, bodily behaviour as well. But also maybe the, the mask is also being um, occupied politically by its association with the young activists in Hong Kong. So we have this f fantastic conjunction of symbolic association between the veil, the mask, both political, biological, and cultural associations. Now, I think um, there is a, a, an opportunity here to not just personalize the masks like Macron did in order to make it look key, um, uh, elegant and, 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 and glitzy, but there's an opportunity to think about how the mask both announces and withholds presence. It announces a mass, and it doesn't necessarily negate identity, but it gives us an opportunity to rethink the boundaries between my person and my collection and my collectivity. And so on the one hand, while we are meeting the limits of our possibilities of intimacy, we are also encountering a possibility of extimacy. Now, the word extimacy, has been adopted recently in sociology and it has its origin in Lacan, who devised it as a, as a sort of counterpoint to Freud's idea of intimacy. So extimite was a way of problematizing that inside-outside boundary. That which was previously thought to be simply on the inside actually operates also on the outside. The real was inside and was outside. Now that idea of that blurring of the interior with the exterior, not just the projection, the exteriorization of the interior, is something that has been profoundly important for thinking about creation, thinking about art. How, where does the creative impulse come from? Unlike the um, romantics who claimed that art, like the an ancient ones, believed that the artist was um, in divine, it was a mediator of divine um, messages from above, or was able to extract from the in depths of their interior subjectivity the deep pools of creativity. The idea of the extimate makes us think about creation in a different way. It's both inside us and outside us, but it's not outside us in the Marxist materialist determinist way. We are where we are just simply shaped by the external influences that are imposed upon us, but rather there is this constant interplay between the interior and the exterior, and the two blur to produce a new kind of topology, a, topo a topos that is both inside and outside. And I think that's the kind of creative, not just concept for understanding creation, but concept for rethinking the political, that will be necessary in this age where our masks will both withhold but announce our presence at the same time. It will withhold our identity at one level, but it will compel, and as it projects, a new kind of identification into the future. Now, I think that living in this way will be a nightmare if we have to live like this for much longer. But in the meantime, I think we must find ways of claiming our our identities in the context and given the resources we have. Thank you very much. This was really, really uh, interesting. And also this uh, relationship between intimacy and uh, um, extimacy, uh, as far as concerned, the aesthetics also of care and uh, of being together. It's very interesting also, um, all the things you said about the passage from the real contact, but also from the barely from the object to the screen and the role of the screen, because we are witnessing also um, a change of habits. I mean, 
before um, there were categories of people who were um, more reluctant to share their private life uh, in the social media. Uh, but we have seen that in, in the last months, people that uh, that before uh, yeah, were reluctant, now are, became suddenly more prone to share private life. Um, and this has been also, I would say, a transgenerational um, transformation. No? We have also um, involved our grandparents, relatives, uh, to get in touch on a more constant basis uh, and so on. So it's, it would be very, very interesting to manage to do this with a more, I would say, a large circle, not only a close circle, but to extend, you know, to do really, um, to do cross-border contact uh, using the new technologies and uh, in this uh, in this situation okay so um, i will pick uh, some uh, of the questions and of the comments we have received during this uh, this talk i would start with a question of uh, and uh, i will read it uh, talking about colonialism and imaginary what do you think about the actual movement of shooting down the statues and monuments and how is it perceived in Australia? Ah, this has been a, um, an issue that has um, um, been, it, it, it didn't just start now. It started with the roads, bringing down the roads sculpture in Oxford. And soon after that happened, that movement, it, when that happened in Oxford about three years ago, um, there was um, a very powerful um, debate amongst indigenous activists, and 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 uh, and there was actually some attacking and violence and defacing of sculptures in Australia as well. Particular Captain Cook, the so-called discoverer of Australia, because of course Australia had been discovered sixty thousand years earlier by the indigenous people of Australia. Now. Um, I've been to Oxford many times, and I've seen where S Cecil Rhodes um, had his sculpture installed. It's above his college. And if you look at that pediment where the sculptures are, it's quite fascinating. On the first row, um, there's a row of sculptures of great philosophers, Aristotle, Socrates, Plato, etc. In the second row, there's a row of, of dignitaries, political leaders, archbishops, dukes, princes, kings. On top of the three of the triangle is Cecil Rhodes himself, the great colonialist who, who you know, Rhodesia was named after, you know, he colonized half of, half of Africa. He put himself on the top of these people as if he's some kind of Zeus figure. I mean, the hubris, the, the absolute ego of the man is hilarious, if you think about it. But it's, for me, it's, it's offensive on so many levels, and so many levels. And, and what I think has been a very interesting debate here in Australia is, is, on the one hand, both the violent reaction against some of these sculptures, which, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, valorize and... Um, and, and make more grandiose than these grandiose guys already claim to have been, um, not just to attack that object itself, but also the necessity to rewrite and reinscribe and to contribute an alternative narrative into our public spaces. So at the moment, the debate is going in two dire directions. One is um, a violent reaction, which is um, wanting to remove and deface. Another is to substitute and, and complement and to alternate. And I think the latter is, of course, the more sophisticated. And the, the former is obviously quite understandable, but not necessarily productive. There are obvious, there, there will obviously be cases where people who were, um, by any standards, unacceptable. And, would, and I think in, in some cases, you know, something has to be done about that presence and some kind of alternative narrative has to be put there as well. 
But what more importantly is the need to reclaim public space and to create alternative narratives so that we recognize um, our own histories. Very recently, a friend of mine, an Indigenous artist called Judy Watson, was in the UK just before this pandemic period. And she with the way in which the British people admired and, and, and with such depth of tenderness and intelligence that historic site. It was striking to her because how little knowledge, tenderness and intelligence there is in the Australian imaginary towards equivalent sites of sacred and cultural value. And so the contrast to her was so powerful that it was it shook her to the bone. And I think the challenge for us in Australia and for many other parts of the world is not necessarily to obliterate whatever is here, but to instigate new kinds of a attachments, knowledge and associations so that we have a more fulsome and more nuanced and more tender relationship to our past. Thank you very much, Nikos, and thank you very much, Perigi, for a very relevant, interesting question. I will pass to another question who comes, uh, which comes from Brazil, from Jonathan Nicoletti, and uh, it's about uh, class and, and that ethnic, I, I would say. I will read it out. The first, good morning from Brazil, the first person infected and who died in Brazil was a black domestic worker. She had to stay at her boss's house, white upper middle class, who had just arrived from Europe and needed help to heat her soup in the evenings. Content's irony. Could you talk a little about the semiotic concept behind the situation? Nikos, I'll pass you the question. The what concept? I didn't hear that word. The the you said the something concept. I didn't grasp that word. Uh, yeah, he 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 would um, he would know more. Uh, he he would know your opinion about the somatic concept, which lies behind a situation which implies class, uh, uh, gender, and uh, and race. You know, about this person. Um, who was a black domestic worker and I had to, yeah. to help with. And in I think that um, this is a, um, an example to, to approach a more broader question about uh, all this, um, to discuss the thing with the intersectional uh, view. Yes. No, no, th this, this, is, um, this is where uh, uh, the crisis accentuates the inequalities and um and, and and makes more visible the way in which people of class and race and gender have different access to resources to in, in this crisis um on on the one hand i i, I spend a lot of time thinking and and discussing with artists and philosophers about alternative ways of being in a city you know um we, we talk a lot about um, how to live outside of the state, how to live without having to be defined by the rules of the state, right? So that in, rather than being a citizen of Australia or Greece, as I am, and rather than being a tourist who has come for a little while but will go, or rather than being a migrant who has arrived and will become a citizen, is on the way to becoming a citizen, and therefore working towards that goal, why can I not be in a place without having to invest my labor in conforming to or adapting into some criteria that the state has defined as citizen, tourist, or migrant. Now, this is an issue that we all, uh, many people in the arts and activism field are constantly grappling with. And, and, these, and we come up with lots of scenarios and imaginative relationships and interstitial and intersectional and hybrid form, creative, creative ways. 
But then when a crisis comes, you realize how when the state wants to prioritize its use of resources, you see who's at the, who is essential and who is less essential. And, and we see how essential Boris Johnson was when he was sick. And we see how unessential so many other people are. We see at the moment in Australia how unessential artists are in terms of support from the government for during the crisis, whereas we see how essential the building industry is and so on and so forth. And similarly with a domestic black worker who has to support a returned sick um, or virus-carrying person, they both get the virus, but only one dies because the state prioritizes its citizens, its white people, its upper middle class people, it gives them superior access to medical support systems. Their bodies are probably uh, better fed, better, better exercised, uh, better rested, and therefore their immune systems are not as vulnerable and as uh, fragile. And so their capacity to, res to, to survive, to be resilient, to bounce back, of course, is enhanced. And so these crises make us realize how these hierarchies uh, are like a loaded gun and they, and, and they can go off against those at the bottom with much more force than they, that they do for those against at the top. I sympathize and I thank you for the, for the anecdote. Thank you, Nikos, and thank you also, Jonathan. I think this was really a necessary question about all these issues. Thank you so much. And Nikos, I will pass you now a question from uh, Rossella Biscotti, a performance and visual artist, so very relevant to our uh, subject, and I will read it out. Um, hello, Nikos. Pandemic has been government's testing ground for the use of technology in controlling and race profiling the population, contact tracing, deploy of drones. We have been seen, we have been seen since Singapore dogs robot patrolling us, patrolling parks. Could you talk about reappropriating by humanize, deracialize and decolonize technology? That is a great challenge, and um, and I agree that um, um, the, the moralizing discourse of we're all in it together is something to be resisted. Um, every institution has utilized that in order to extract uh, more control over the people that it actually is uh, working with. I, I am sick to death of people um, saying, we're only doing this for your health and safety. We're only doing this for your well, because we care about your well-being. I don't believe anyone really cares anymore. They just say these things in order to extract and exploit. And so with this new language of uh, and rhetoric of motherhood and, and compassion has become an incredible bogus in our society. And, and I'm, I'm personally um, furious about it. Our, our government tried to impose that we all um, download an app so that in case we did get the virus, they would be able to um, work out who we've been in proximity to and where we have travelled in the immediate period of time. I refuse to download that app. I look forward to um, other artists and other activists um, working out alternative ways in which um, my security and my um, companionship and my solidarity with and my concern for other people is also developed. Now, I'm not sure we've, we've quite got to that stage of being able to transform and modify, but I think there is a strong urge now for us to not only be ironic about the um, um, discourse and the habits, and the contact tracing and the uses of technology that have been put in place for our well-being. But also, I think we now are going to have to work out um, ways to reroute them, to find alternative uses of them, and to provide some um, uh, bypass mechanisms from for them. 
And so I agree with Rosella, and I know Rosella from uh, we, we shared some time together at the beginning of this pandemic in, in Singapore, and we've met in other occasions as well. And so thank you for the question, Rosella, and I, I assume you're back and safe in, in Italy. But um, I, 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 I would welcome more information about how we can, um, as you say, um, take control of the technology before the technologies take control of us. Thank you, Nikos, and thank you, Rosella. This was a very, very interesting question, which concerns also the issues of control, the body control, territory control, borders control, and how the technological level affects our biopolitics life. And um, I will pass to another question now from Martina uh, Bedeschini Bucci, which concerns university and corporations. And uh, Nikos, what would you be expect? Uh, uh, what could be the role of academics in this specific moment? So, role of university and of our academics. That's a very good question. Um, <laughs> At the moment, literally yesterday, our government announced um, an increase of, of, um, of the fees for attending universities. Our government, at the beginning of this crisis, announced that they would provide income for people who were impacted by the crisis. That they would have some financial support on, from their mortgages, from their rent, and for day-to-day -day survival. The government went out of its way to rewrite the rules so that university employees were not eligible for any income support from the government. On top of that, that today they've announced that fees at universities in the arts degree will double, more than double. So it'll be more expensive to do an arts degree at the University of Melbourne than it will be to do a medicine degree. So there is an ideological agenda that's going on right now to um, cripple and instrumentalize and to negate critical discourse in the campuses, in the university sector. The government, uh, we have a, uh, a not an extremely far right, but a center to far right government, and um, it is highly, highly um, suspicious, if not antagonistic, with the university sector. Even though, in my state, universities provide enormous income, it's the third biggest export generator of my state because of international students and the income generated through that stream of people coming to Australia. But my, my um, problem right now is that how much of the debate around COVID has been about money? and the loss of money because of international travel from tourism from students, the loss of income from student fees, the increase of student fees, etc. cetera. And, and it produced a lot of debate about how um, people who are precarious in the university sector are being exploited even more, and how the university sector has gone out of its way to be less transparent and more authoritarian in the situation. I work in a university where the provost has decided that every single casual, part-time, temporary appointment has to be approved by him. So that thousands of people now have to wait until he signs off on every single appointment. He, of course, will not take the responsibility of communicating or negotiating with anybody in particular, but he's imposed this rule so that everybody internalizes and shapes their imagination, their habits, and their uh, associations with the idea that we are going through a period of austerity. Whether we are or not, we don't know because our financial situation is not being made transparent and clear to us. So at the one level, what the university sector can do is, of course, demand greater transparency and security for the precarious. 
but also to pull back power that has been over the last two or three decades been centralized more and more in the administrative parts of the university's chancellery system. But this must sound so boring to everyone outside of a university. Universities, of course, have got more important things to do than worry about their own internal finances and, and um, power structures. We should be places where we are rethinking the public. We are working, as, as many of my colleagues in the medical faculty are, to find a vaccine. To thinking about how health and health care and society can be supported. So, it, I regret how much energy has been sucked into moralistic and economic defensive positions. And I think it's incumbent upon us to always keep at the front and center of our imagination the bigger picture issue that must also be part of our public presence as intellectuals and, and scholars. Thank you, Nikos, and thank you also, Martina, for your questions. And Nikos, I will pass you now uh, another very interesting question of Melissa Moralli, who was also a speaker during this festival. And the question is, um, what about the role of public space in the peripheries of the cities? Here, sometimes public art is used to promote urban regeneration. That this could lead to gentrification and further pro pro uh, processes of exclusion. That's an excellent point, and it's true. Um, a big buzzword in the gentrification, urbanization, and instrumentalization of the arts is creating arts precincts. Arts precincts have been used as showcases, as beacons of cultural practice of key artistic places to locate, co-locate great art institutions. And in some ways, this has performed a lot of different functions simultaneously. And the government has been very comfortable with the, these kinds of activities, whereby they can concentrate together in, in a very discreet area, um, large cultural icons like the National Gallery, the cinema centres, theatres, opera centres, etc., all in one space. And that becomes a, sort of a mass, massive attractor. And so on the one hand, it becomes a presti prestige symbol, but it also is a way of showing this is what the art are. But all it's in fact mostly doing, not entirely, but mostly doing, is preserving the heritage arts, the iconic art form. It's also... Um, feeding into the whole discourse of art and the culture and tourist industry. So that art is good because it stimulates the economy, it provides investment and encourages more tourist dollars to be spent and so on and so forth. So it enables a kind of um, instrumentalization and an economic return on investment for the, for the government. So that also makes the government feel very happy and in, 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 the, in my city, it's been an enormous success story. But the third dimension in this is that it also makes the government feel, feel like it's fulfilling another mandate, which is cultural and social inclusion. Because in these new precincts, it's possible to stage large outdoor festivals. It's possible to stage, you know, um, events like White Night, which are enormously successful. So masses and masses of people can congregate in these cultural locations. Now, in fact, according to recent statistics, um, maybe five to ten times more people attend artistic experiences and events that are held outside of cultural institutions than those that are held inside cultural institutions. So these precincts uh, have been um, very, very successful at both cultural cohesion, preserving heritage institutions, and stimulating economic uh, revitalization of the centers. However, with all those benefits, as you say, what has gone towards developing more critical and socially engaged? Uh, and how do we speak to the peripheries? Almost all the funding that goes to 
towards the arts in Australia goes to the hardware. This infrastructure costs these large events. A tiny proportion, a tiny percent, less than 5% of the art money goes towards experimental, critical, or arts in the region or in the peripheries of the city. What is that producing? It's producing, as we see in many parts of the world, a polarization where you have inner city, liberal, kind of multicultural communities, and then you have this outer suburban polarization whereby there is a profound growing, growing disconnect between what happens in the peripheries and what happens in the center. And I think um, in Australia, and as we've seen in the US and in the UK, and I assume maybe it's not so transparent in, in other parts of Italy, but I, I would like to know more, that th this polarization is, is a political time bomb that is already, already having consequences on us. I can't hear you, Manuela. You've put the microphone off. Your microphone is still off for some reason. Ah, now you're back on. Okay. Thank you, Nico. And thank you, Melissa, for the very interesting question. So uh, now we have uh, uh, other two questions that I would uh, pick up and then and that probably we will be finished because we're running out of the time. So um, the first one comes from London, from Color Carver. And uh, it concerns uh, the recent manifestation, we read it loud. In the UK, there has been a weekly clapping in the streets for the NHS, National Health Service, and a lot of public art in home windows and on the street, which show supports for the, for the NHS too. What are your reflections on this collective public art focus? I uh, admire that sentiment. I think it's a, um, a beautiful expression of, of spontaneous solidarity that was not orchestrated and it arrails out of a, a collective feeling of, of, of care and appreciation. Um, I'm suspicious, however, how that is being manipulated and to what extent it will be internalized and, and, and activated into a different notion of the care for the common. And uh, I, I'm not sure that um, Boris Johnson and his government is capable of hearing that clapping, of, of accepting the sense of duty and vocation that people in the health service exercise on a daily basis. That's a word I'm sure that is probably foreign in many people's um, political discourse. The word vocation is um, alien. The clapping is speaking to people who have still kept alive that sense of a vocation. I wish our political and our corporate leaders would also hear the resonance between this bodily gesture of clapping and the other kinds of sacrifice and and commitment to duty that is exercised in people's labor. Okay. Thank you, Nikos. And uh, thank you, uh, Colin Carver. I will pass to the next question, who is uh, who concerns the technological and controlled domain. Actually, it is about the apps, which is a very uh, delicate uh, issue. Um, we have a question of Cristo Presutti from Bologna, and uh, it's a reflection on the apps. Uh, he say uh, these apps are being developed under huge public control. They are open source and monitored by communities of developers worldwide, and so a lot of attention is on privacy issues as far as possible. And uh, expressing this concern, uh, while at the time, at the same time, uh, use YouTube and Facebook or Zoom. Um, to express them is quite ridiculous. I think it's uh, it's about the usage. 
all these big companies do collect more information about your life, insurance, health problem, friends, in one second connection than every contact tracing up in years. Yeah, so it's about this, um, the privacy, basically. What do you think about this, about these apps? Do you agree? I agree, and <laughs> I have to express my ignorance in this area. I, I, uh, I am someone who um, is um, almost technophobic. Uh, I get very stressed with even the smallest um, uh, um, steps that I have to follow. I mean, I managed to get here with the assistance of my 16-year-old daughter, I have to confess. And most things are like that for me. But I agree. I mean, the more in which these apps can be developed collectively for the public and transparent and um, use, the less it's diverted towards this um, um, private um, corporation. Is, 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 of course, is a political claim that I share with um, your colleague in, in Bologna. Um, the, uh, the other issue, however, as a sociologist and someone that uh, who follows public behaviour a little bit more carefully rather than technological controls, the, fun, the issue that I find very fascinating is the extent to which generations can say, I don't mind if this corporation harvests all this data about me. What will they do with it anyway? And what difference will it actually make to my life? So there's a blasé attitude that that is um, adopted, which is probably not dissimilar to the way in which people say, oh, so what if I walk down the street not wearing a shirt and a top? It doesn't mean that I don't, you know, uh, how is that going to affect my job performance 10 years later, the fact that I walk down the main street of the city? In full glare and full attention to the public in a less than formal way. How does these informal, these barriers of formality and informality impact on on me? Now it seems to me that we, as a society, have become quite blasé about um, information that is is kept. Information has always been kept in people's memories and people's impressions. Now the accessing of this of that information in in these large, vast servers and these new capacity to extract and synthesize that information to create stories and and make conclusions about other people is a frightening dimension. And so my solidarity is about resisting the way in which that information is stored and harvested and then configured to produce outcomes which are not just um, um, commercial ones like what you might want to buy next from Amazon, but also political ones like what you're likely to do, or even biological ones, whether you are eligible for insurance given your eating habits. So I think these are all examples of how in which the technology will be determining us rather than we being used in it. So we need to be vigilant about these things as well. Thank you very much. I would look forward to hearing more about how these apps can be used for more collective benefit rather than for some commercial interests. Thank you, Nikos, very much. And thank you also, Cristiano, because this was really a crucial issue which, con which is of concern for, uh, for all of us. And Nikos, if you're not, not too tired, I will uh, close. Um, uh, collecting a comment of Lorenzo Polito, which, which actually is related to the previous question on university and academics. And then I will, put you the, uh, I will pass you the question of Michel Jacquet. So I start with Lorenza, uh, which says that in the UK, we are having similar issues with universities being transformed into the profit organizations. The COVID pandemic is the the perfect pretext for the government to withdraw further from their funding responsibilities, hence letting many universities fail and making higher education something for the few, including art degrees. So it's a, it's a comment and a, a reflection which, uh, which goes with 
what was said before with our, with our reflection. And then uh, I will pass to the question of Michel Jacquet, which is uh, an uh, art curator in, uh, in France, and I'm so happy to see him here participating. And he says, uh, uh, thank you so much for this great talk regarding cosmo cosmopolitanism, uh, cosmopolitanism, French philosopher Francis Wolff talks about a new utopia to our measure as a point of view from nowhere. What do you think, Nikos, about philosophical position? Does this sound familiar to you? If you, do you want me to read again the... Let me repeat one more time, yes. I would like to hear this a little bit more clearly. Sure. So you from the point of view of nowhere. Yeah, uh, French philosopher Francis Wall. And uh, he, he talks about a new utopia to our measure as a point of view from nowhere. So it's quite an interesting view because um, it's related also this idea of imagination of reinventing the future with uh, we have started this uh, talk well that's that's fantastic it brings us it does tie it back to the big questions that we began with and the cosmopolitan question is one that i don't think i will ever completely accomplish or satisfy myself ever in my life I'm returning to it over and over again, and so it's fascinating to hear this um, definition of a new utopia to our own measure. I'm, I'm um, fascinated because I think the whole discourse of cosmopolitanism has been so contracted, so reduced since the whole modern period. It's been reduced to a moral, ethical discourse that can't afford for put forward and has been adopted and refined and, and um, reduced even further um, by subsequent modern and contemporary philosophers. Um, what has been lost is the connection between the cosmos and all of nature. And what the Anthropocene debates are now compelling us to think about is how our ethical relationship to each other as cosmopolitans is also an ethical relationship to the cosmos, which is all of nature. So the relationship between ethics and normals, which has dominated the political philosophy of cosmopolitanism, needs to be exploded to reintroduce the wider sense of belonging to a cosmos, to all of nature. Thesis, therefore, needs to be the integral concept to reboot the cosmos in cosmopolitanism, not just the globe of globalization. Now, the idea of a new utopia to our own measure, I find intriguing because that, in a sense, um, makes it re internalize the specificity, I, I suspect, of, of cosmopolitan agency. And I, I, I would like to obviously hear a lot more from Francois. Um, Michel, sorry, about this idea from France as well. I'm not familiar with this particular definition. But um, as a parting comment, I would like to sort of also juxtapose utopia from cosmopolitanism. For me, cosmopolitanism is about being open to the world, about how we deal with questions of flow, not just welcoming the other and providing hospitality, but also being open to other possibilities and creating new scenarios. Utopia was perfect. It was the idyllic island in Thomas More's case. In Utopia, it was so perfect, no one ever needed to leave home. So in that sense, Utopia and cosmopolitanism are not exactly... Um, uh, in, in tune with each other, but thank you. I'd like to, uh, but I'm being, but this I'm sure there's a different meaning that could be picked up as well at some point. Thank you so much, Nikos, and uh, thank you so much, Michelle, for have put this question because, uh, uh, yes, it it is connected to the beginning of the 
conversation so we end in a circular way and we also close with uh, on a positive uh, tone uh, thinking to concept of uh, utopia of cosmos of planet and uh, so uh, this is quite uh, it's uh, food for thoughts and um, it's, a, it's a good way to to finish this conversation um, so Thank you, Nikos, very much. This was very, very interesting. And uh, thank you, everyone, for being here with us and for uh, listening and participating with all these interesting questions. And uh, we, we will meet in the afternoon uh, for, the, for the next meetings. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.